continue on in our number three and trusting God in 2023. Sermon number three. Don't you want to know how long this is going to go? I can tell you. All the way to the end. Right, exactly. Until I'm finished. So, that's <laughs> how. It's how long the series is going to take, all the way to the end. <laughs> Amen. Well, come on, stand with me for the reading of God's Word. This is the second section of uh, Psalms 46. Remember, it's divided into three sections there. So starting in verse number four, there is a river. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy, holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold, Salah. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful tonight to be able to read your word and to study it and have you break it open to us in ways that we can understand and its nourishment to our soul. And so, to Lord, tonight as we begin to look at this second section, there's things in your word all of us need here, and we're... As we are attentive to your spirit and to what you would speak to us, we pray, Lord, that as you read our lives, you would apply it exactly the way that we need to hear it this evening and that it would be a help and that it would be an encouragement and um, even challenging where it needs to be, but certainly life-changing. And, Lord, we put that type of work in your hand. That's the only way it's going to get done. Is through your hand and through your work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so we rely on that and we count you good for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. You can be seated this evening as we began. Now, last week, remember, we started out with God is our refuge and our strength. And we talked about the idea of a stronghold and the idea of strength and that he was a very present God, remember, is what we focused on last week. It seemed like last week the meat of it was uh, right at the very first verse. Remember, he makes that statement of faith there that God is a, a, God is a refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And then all the benefits started to come from that, that we we'll, don't have to fear and the mountains slip into the sea and the, the waters roar and foam and the mountains quake and it's swelling on all of that. But we were fine, remember, because we were in a stronghold. We had a, a refuge and God's our strength and he's a very present God. That He's not some far off God uh, just waiting to see what happened. No, he's a very, very near God. And so the, the sons of Korah then who write this psalm continue on then with the next segment of stuff. And, and then this, kind, this time um, is kind of... The, the, the real heart of it is at the end of this in verse number 7. But there's some, some, some really good stuff at the beginning as well. And then the middle is kind of a repeat of last time. But everything's falling apart, but we're going to be fine, right? Is in the middle of it. You remember, God is in the midst of her. She'll not be moved. Uh, God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. Sound a little bit like last week, right? Everything's going to pieces as we watch, but we're fine because God is with us. So listen to the first part of this, and we'll get into it. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Now, the first thing you want to notice about this is that... Um, in two of these statements, there is a, 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 a verses there. There's a singular versus a plural in the same statement. And so in the, in the first one, in verse 4, it's a river uh, singular with streams plural. All right? River singular, streams plural. There is a river 
whose streams make glad the city of God. There's the second one. The city of God is a singular city there. And then is verses, the holy dwelling places, plural, of the Most High God. So what's that? what are we talking about here? Well, the sons of Korah are part of the worship team there in Jerusalem, right? And so you have there the city of God. Um, guess what? No river in Jerusalem. Not even close. Not, there's really not even a stream, actually, a natural stream. There is one water source for Jerusalem for thousands of years. And you got to remember that when you're building a city, one of the uh, single most important things you got to have to be a fortified city is you got to have a source of water because otherwise in times of siege, then uh, you're going to be in a, in a hot spot. You're going to be in a mess if you don't have a defensible place of water if you don't have a river if you don't have a source of water some kind of way you are not going to last out long against a, a siege right and so one of the things about jerusalem is there is no river there is no stream but there is this there is a natural spring it's called the spring of gihon uh, if you're interested in that, Gihon means surging. It's a Hebrew word for surging, that it surge. Now, the reason for that is because the Gihon spring is actually one of 20 siphonic springs in the world, all right? In the on the entire planet, it's called a siphonic, so it siphons, all right? And so what that means is it doesn't flow all the time, it surges, and the way that it surges is backed up against there, there's a cave, and that cave has to fill up with water. Think, um, what's the old faithful, the geyser, right? You can time it, right? And if you've ever been out to Yellowstone, uh, it's not doing anything, not going to do anything, and then exactly, on, whoosh, it goes up, and then it's dormant again, all right? That's the Gihon Spring, is that this cave fills up with water, then creates a vacuum, and when the vacuum is there, once the cave is full, then it siphons out through the tunnel, through the outlet then, and it surges out, and it's this bubbling spring then, this surging spring that goes out, then it's a freshwater spring. That's why it's called the Gihon Spring. So in the time of Hezekiah, which most scholars think that this psalm is actually written during the siege of Assyria, the king's name was Sennacherib, all right? Sennacherib comes and he's going to lay siege to them. And the most important part of all of the defenses is keep that spring secure. It's outside the city walls. Wouldn't you know it? And so they build some towers out there to protect it. And then King Hezekiah says, that's not good enough to have these towers protecting it because after all, that's how David took the place because it was a, a town called Salem before David uh, took it, right? And he sent men up the shaft and, and then his mighty men of warriors, they, they went actually went up the the shaft, and, and that's how they took the city from the inside out, through the shaft of this, when the vacuum was broken and the water level was down, because that water will continue to surge while the vacuum is, is um, broken, right, until it springs up again, until it fills up again. So while it's empty, you can get some men up there. So Hezekiah says, um, I know what we'll do. Why should Sennacherib be able to come here and drink our water? Let's change it. So they, he diverted the water, that Gihon string, to the west side. Sennacherib's on the east side uh, doing the siege. And so they divert it to the west side of Jerusalem inside the city walls then. And they build what's known today as Hezekiah's Tunnel. Now, it, it's, you can actually go there and walk this tunnel. It's a great tourist walk right now because 
Now, Jerusalem, thousands of years later, is not dependent on that water source. They actually get water now from like 25 miles away, and they pump it in then through the, through the water system, through the wa city water. But then, very important, right? And so it, they divert it, and they build this tunnel end to end, and they meet in the middle, and they actually discovered then the plaque that was engraved in the limestone wall of when the two, come, the, the ones digging from this end and the ones digging from that end, they met on the wall and they said, this is where we met and, un, under the city of Jerusalem. You can take that walk and there's these little narrow uh, passageways where the stream of the Gihon stream goes through. One stream for that whole thing. Now, say what's the importance of that? Listen, we don't know where the river is, all right? Something's feeding these. There's rainwater coming down through, but something's feeding these, these things. All streams are fed somewhere. You get what I'm saying? So here, here's a little fact for you. The Mississippi River, you, you know where it originates? In a little town, you got to go north. It empties into the Gulf of Mexico, all right? Uh, and then, but in order to get to the headwaters of the Mississippi, you've got to go 2,551 miles northwest up to a little place called Ithaca, Minnesota, right? And there at the headwaters of the Mississippi, you can put two people standing side by side, and I can touch the bank on this side, and he can touch the bank on that side at the headwaters. You can walk across the Mississippi, right? But all the way down for 2,500 miles, the Mississippi is feeding stream after stream after stream after stream after stream after stream from one river, all kinds. Thousands of streams are met and are fed going to different places and neighborhoods and home, all of these places that are in the, everything is fed off of that one river all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Here's what the writer said. There's one river. It's our source is this guy that we're talking about. This God, our stronghold, our refuge. There's one God. He's our God. And guess what? But he's going to the dwelling places. Uh, the dwelling places, plural. All of these people that are inside this city. All these people that are serving God. This one source is coming through. And he's going to feed every single home. Every single house that's serving him. That river is somehow going to get a source to that river, to that place that needs it. It goes all the way down to the, and opens up. When you take a walk, I assume you all want to get on a plane this week and go do it. When you take the walk, where you're going to come out is at the Pool of Siloam. That's where you're going to come out at where the bubbling of the waters indicated the angels stirring and it was the surging and people being killed because God operates on faith. And this one river is feeding still today all these different streams because there's a stream of faith in your house why you're here tonight there's a stream of faith in your family there's a stream of faith in this church and all around the world and it's all coming from this one single source and now he starts to come down in the nations that are are again in an uproar and the kingdoms are tottering and he raised his voice and the earth melted and but but listen to these calming words he says the Lord of hosts is with us. And it sounds a lot like last time, except that last time he says God is our refuge. This time he uses a different word. He uses the Lord. In verse number five, he says God is in the midst, right? Um, in verse number four, he says it's the city of God, right? Different word. And, but now all of a sudden, there's this tenderness that comes into a voice, and, it, and he's and he says this, the Lord of hosts. 
here's, and then the very next phrase, he goes back to the God, the God, different word. The God of Jacob is with us. So the first thing I want to know is, why did you pick Jacob? Because after all, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and it seems like the first two are a better bet than Jacob was, right? I mean, if you read the story of Jacob, that guy's a conniving little snitch, right? It, it, the guy's a deceiver. He's a cheater. He's, doing, he's just not the best role model. And yet these guys, the sons of Pars say, that's our guy right there, the God of Jacob. That's, that, you know, what about Abraham and Isaac, right? That's supposed to be a trifecta there. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you, could, you just bypass the first two? Right? The one who's going to lay his life down because Abraham says, God told me to sacrifice you. Okay, Dad, if that's what you think. Uh, you, you, you bypass those two, and, and Abraham's willing to do it because he says, hey, if, if, if I go through it, then God can raise him from the... You bypass those two to go to Jacob who says, I want the birth, the, the birth blessing, the firstborn so bad I'm willing to cheat my, my brother out of it and lie to my father and do all of this stuff that goes on, and that's the one you want to hang your hat on? What's going on with this? And the second thing is, why is the changing of the, of the word with, between God and Lord and all this? Here's, here's what's going on. There's, this is why there's such a tenderness there. He says, the Lord is with us. It's a it's a phrase that they learn. You know, this is the second week in a row. Dad used the same verse that I'm going to use. He did it last week, too. I was afraid he was going to preach my sermon again this morning. Because here, this is only the second time. I told you last week, the book of Psalms is divided into five books, right? This is the second book. It's only the second time in book two of the book of Psalms that this word is used. It's the personal name of God, the personal name. Israel had a personal name of God. It's like having, um, I don't know, it, it's like having Bill Gates give you his unlisted number that nobody else can get, right? It's like if you need a couple bucks, call me. Here's my personal number, right? If you need some lunch money, here my personal cell phone, call me anytime. It's my personal, it's the personal name of God is what they resort to here. All before this, they're using the title of God. They're using Elohim and, and, and the, 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 the proper name of God is what they're using, right? The, 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 big, the big title on the door, right? And now here's what they're doing. They're going, but... You know, I've never called him Pastor Hardesty in private. I've never yet walked into the house and said, Pastor Hardesty, are you home? I walk in and I say, Dad. Or Daddy. Yes, I'm 57. I still call him Daddy. We're south of the Mason-Dixie line. What can I say? All right? So... That's what they're doing here. It's the personal name, uh, just this intimate name. And where did they learn this name at? That he's, it's only the second time in book two that this thing is used here, this name is used. They learned it with Moses at the burning bush. That's where they learned. That's how God, and they didn't, nobody heard this name before Moses. What about Abraham and Isaac? No, they didn't know this name, right? Here in verse number cha three, uh, chapter three of Exodus and 13, Moses is up on the mountain there and there's this burning bush and he says, I got to turn aside to see this thing. And, and the, you know the story. How, and he says, but when I go there, they're going to ask me, who sent you? What am I going to say? And God says, I am that I am. But that's not the name of God. That's the description of his name. That's what it means. It's this whole name here, the reason they go to it in, chapter, in verse number 7, the Lord of hosts is, is because it, it was meant to convey to Israel the ever-presentness of God in their midst, that he was never going to leave them. When he brought them out of Egypt, he was never going to leave them. It's the, it, 
That's what it conveys to them. It's the ever-presentness of God. I am that I am. But listen to what he says. Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me. God, verse 15, very next verse. God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord... The God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you, the Lord. That's his personal name. It's Yahweh. That's the name, Yahweh, the Lord. And then he goes, the God, the big title, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has sent me. This is my name Forever, listen to these words, this is my memorial name to all generations. This is my personal name for you. Here's my unlisted number. When we call this name, we got a relationship. This isn't the name on the door. This is the relationship name, right? You're in the family if you have this name, right? This is Yahweh we're talking to here. This is dad. This, this is our personal God. This is my memorial name. And then, he, here's something interesting, right? They're still negotiating here. They're, uh, honest to goodness, Moses goes, but they're still negotiating. And, and, and then the Lord, the, um, he goes down and he tells um, Pharaoh, hey, the Lord said, you know, God said, let my people go, and <laughs> who's your God, well, uh, all of that. And then in chapter 6, before he starts, right before he starts sending the plagues, here's what he says. Then the Lord said to Moses, now you will see what I'm going to do to Pharaoh. For under compulsion will he let you go. And under compulsion he will drive them from out of his land. And God spoke further to Moses and said to him, I am, and he uses this personal name again, the Lord. I am Yahweh, my personal name, because I'm coming to your defense. I'm rising up. My arm is about ready to lay some heavy wood down. And I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, big name on the door. That's how he knew them. I appeared to them as God Almighty, but by my name, Lord, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. That blew my mind. I had no idea. He talked to Abraham in Ur of the Chaldees and said, hey, leave everything you have and go to a place. I'm not even going to tell you where you're going to go. Just start walking. I'll get you there. And Abraham did it, and he didn't even know his name. I reckon the title on the door was big enough to impress him, I guess. But he left everything and went there, and all these people following him, Isaac and Jacob and everybody up and tell now Moses is in there and he's saying it's the first time I'm telling anybody this name I'm giving it to you because I'm bringing you out and I'm never going to leave you again this is my ever present promise to you I'm always going to be there I'm always going to be among you and I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan and the land to which they stored you. And he's promising them this. Personal name of God. And that's what the sons of Korah, after they're talking about the nations making an uproar and kingdoms are tottering and, and the earth, he raised his voice and the earth melted. He, he said, it's okay, Yahweh. Is our stronghold. We're going to be just fine. Everybody outside these walls of this city might be going to pieces, but inside here, we're, we, all these homes are fed by a river that will never run dry. Every one of these homes are, is fed by the all-sufficient one, and he's going to make sure we have all that we need in 
this. So why the God of Jacob? Listen. Jacob was the one who had his name changed to Israel. All right? That's who he was. It is one thing for God to turn an Abram into an Abraham. The guy was pretty faithful, wouldn't you say? I mean, he leaves everything, and he goes on this journey, not knowing where he's going to go or wind up and face all the trials along the way, and he never saw. He just goes, goes. He made some mistakes, but, but listen, look what he did, right? He's the father of the faithful for crying out loud, right? And so for, to be God of him, I'll take that, all right? And Isaac, you're talking about the guy here who's going to lay his life down. His dad's going to sacrifice him and goes, good with me if you think God really... God didn't tell any of that to Isaac, but Isaac had a relationship with his dad. He knew his dad's faith. He knew his dad's relationship with this God. And so he says, if it's good enough for you, I'll trust you on this thing. Okay, it's one thing to be a God of an Isaac, but to... But to be able to turn a Jacob into an Israel, that takes some doing. All right? That takes some, that is years in the process. When you read Jacob's story, that is years in the process. Plus an all night wrestling match to boot. All right? And that's, I think, the majority of us. You know, Majority of Christians are not overnight perfect saints. <laughs> I hate to break it to you. I mean, there's a couple. <laughs> not the big one, the little one. Over there, <laughs> right? This is just over there. There's a couple. But most of us, years in the process of learning and growing <laughs> and failing and learning and growing and failing and you just keep going down the track and and the thing is you're just staying faithful with it just staying faithful and not giving up and just keep on going and keep on going and keep on going it's turning a Jacob into a in into an Israel but the biggest thing that 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 the sons of Korah had was they had the personal name of God, right? They had that personal name of God going on with them. And they knew what that meant because Moses told him what that meant. Here's the rest of the revelation of how important they were to God that he would give them that his personal name to call on, that they're in the family, they're in this relationship. It's this, that they're a treasured possession. Here's what Moses tells them before they ever go into the promised land, before they ever make it big, before they ever get all the promise. They're still on the other side, right? They're still just wandering people they haven't possessed a single foot of the promised land yet and here's what Moses tells them for you are a holy people in Deuteronomy chapter 7 for you are a holy people to the Lord your God the Lord your God the Yahweh your God the you're a holy people to them for your God has chosen you to be a people for his own get this treasured possession out of all the peoples of the earth who are on the face of the earth look at them all all the people all the nations around you the lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you are more in number than any of the peoples for you were the fewest of all peoples but because the yahweh loved you and kept an oath which he swore to your forefathers the yahweh brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of pharaoh the king of egypt know therefore that the yahweh your god he is god the faithful god who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousand generations and to those who love him and keep his commandments your treasured 
possession of his. Goes on in De Deuteronomy 26. The Lord this day has declared you to be his people. A treasured possession as he promised you. And here, years later now, the sons of Korah are sitting here. And they've got Sennacherib on one side. And there's a siege being planned against them. And, but they're fed. They've got a spring that's gonna, that is just going to all, that's feeding all the homes. And they know it's a river from God that, that's going from a single source down to all the people here. And they say, I'm not worried about him because the Lord is in the midst of her. The Lord of hosts is with us. Do you hear the simplicity of those words? Um, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob. The God who turned us into Israel, he's our stronghold. Salah, think about that. Think about that. Let me tell you something about treasures. This is my mom's treasures. I called her um, yesterday after the baby shower for Kim, and I said, do you still have told her? I knew she had it, because it's been in the cedar chest for 51 years, <laughs> maybe 52 years, because I'm 57, and it was when I was in kindergarten. Um, I bet some of you have things like this. The Smithsonian isn't coming to get them, I'll tell you. <laughs> right? The Smithsonian isn't, isn't exactly baiting the door down to say, we got to have those for, you know, southern folk art or anything. But there's some things in her cedar chest that are, she is dragged all over the place. They moved 11 times in 20 years. Been to 27 different countries. Um, I don't know what it is, but I made it. <laughs> it's got my name under it. My mom swears it's a vase of some kind, a dual vase. I have no idea what that is. And nobody else can tell her either, um, but she swears it's a vase and it's worth holding on to. It's worth sticking in a cedar chest and taking up room and dragging all over the place because that's a treasure to her. It's not a treasure to anybody else. That's the important things of treasures. You know, what's important to one, nobody else cares about. That's what the sons of Korah are talking about, right? Nobody else cares about you. You're not the biggest, baddest nation on the block. But God chose you. You were the least of them. And God just chose you. You're a treasure to him. Here's a real masterpiece. Isn't that cute? That's a Sunday school lesson. There are some little people over here who need to be saved in a little boat. I guess it's BGMC. And uh, it's a treasure. Doesn't stand up straight, but. There's my little Sunday school project. It's just a plastic Cool Whip lid. <laughs> I know what a Cool Whip lid is. You can believe, if I know anything, I know a Cool Whip red lid when I see one with the little blue thing taken out of the center, right? Um, and a piece of yarn and a cut out piece of paper. 
nobody in the world cares about it except them. That's what treasure looks like. That's what it looks like. And here's my personal favorite. Here's my two little butterflies. <laughs> Bit bumblebees. I can't even tell. They're bumblebees. Now you can tell somebody did the face on this one because I wouldn't draw that because I drew that face. They're easy to tell apart there. But there's my two little bumblebees that she is. <laughs> that one's got quite the stinger on the back there. That's a pretty, <laughs> that's a pretty big dot I'd put on that one. It's not sure I was drawing a stinger there, but <laughs> I don't know. This is just nothing but egg carton. Two little egg carton things. You know when your carton, when your egg carton went in styrofoam? You remember those days, right? Little cardboard carton thing and a little piece of pipe cleaner and a piece of cardboard paper and a magic marker and you've got treasure. That's what you got. At the end of that, you don't have a bumblebee. What you've got is you've got treasure then. I'm going to tell you something. The world will look at you and I, and a lot of things, times they will see less than what you truly are, because what you truly are, you look like this to the world. This is what we look like, but to God, we're treasure, we're treasured possession that he will always come to the defense of, and he will always come to help. That's why they end this. Nations are in an uproar. The kingdoms totter. He raised his voice. The earth melted. Big breath. The Lord. Always. Is with us. The God of Jacob turned me into Israel. And he looks at me like treasure, like his very own treasured possession. Salah. Think about that. Why wouldn't you trust a God who sees you for who you truly are and says, you're treasured to me. You're my own treasured possession because I've turned you from Jacob and I've crafted you in and made you into Israel. You're my treasured possession and I will always be there for you. I will always defend you. I will always help you. I'll always be there. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word this evening. We just, Lord, we're in awe of such love, such undeserved, unmerited grace and love, and yet you pour it out and you look at us with these eyes that just say, I love you. You're a treasure to me. It may not be to anybody else, and everybody else just sees a bumblebee made out of egg cartons or clay something that we're guessing it's a vase. But what you see, what you see is treasure. And you look at every one of us that same way. Father, would you help us to realize that? To just be able to internalize that and to make that our own, that that truth of Scripture, that statement of faith, and to make that our own. And I pray that it feeds us day after day after day after day. That truth just feeds us.
And Lord, if we do that pretty soon, we'll stop looking at ourselves as Jacob. (laughs) And we'll know we've been changed for Israel now. And we have your name on our lips and in our heart. Help us with that. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Hallelujah. Listen. Why don't you take a few moments tonight. And just come around this altar and just say, God, that's the way you look at me. I just want to say thank you for that. I just want to say thank you for turning me into an Israel and looking at me like treasure. Amen? Come on. Hallelujah.